right. Turn in your Bibles to that section if you haven't, if you're not already there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. This morning, the title of the message is Living Under Imperfect Authority. Victorious Living Under Imperfect Authority. And uh, if you were going to boil it down at the theme of our message this morning, it would be patient endurance of unjust suffering shines a breathtaking light on God's worth. Thank you, bro. Patient endurance of unjust suffering shines a breathtaking light on God's worth. We sang the songs this morning about his attributes, Behold Our God, We think of God's omnipresence, omnipotence, his omniscience, the fact that he is of greatest worth and value. We sang these things, and we are called then to live out that, who God is, to a watching world. And that's Peter's admonition here. The whole section is about being subject. Uh, In verse 13, it's being subject to every human institution. Verse 18, it's servants, be subject to your masters. Next week, uh, Lord willing, we'll be in chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. And husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And so on. So this is a section on believers being subject. And when you hear that, it automatically, I think, in some people's minds registers, oh, so Christians must be weak because they have to remain under. That the idea of subjection equals weakness. And so nothing could be further from the truth. To stand for truth in the face of overwhelming opposition and hatred to res- and to resist in that moment bitterness, to resist hatred of those who oppose you, And to love an enemy is the evidence of the greatest strength that anybody could ever have. And it's an evidence of God's presence and power and love. In in the book, Jesus Freaks, the author cites various martyrs in their last words to their captors. You tell me if this is weakness. Maurice Blanc, martyred in France in 1547. He prayed, Lord, these men take away my life full of misery, but you will give me life everlasting. Justin Martyr, beheaded A.D. 165 in Rome, said, you can kill us, but you cannot do us any real harm. I I like that. You can kill us, but you really can't do us any real harm. How about Martin Luther, 500 years ago, 1521, stood before the emperor, princes, lords, and leaders of the Roman Catholic Church in that day in the city of Worms, Germany, called to account for teaching and writing the truth about the gospel. This great august body of leaders were telling him, your writings and your teachings have to go. Luther, we will declare you a heretic, which was essentially a death sentence. We will declare you a heretic unless you recant all your teachings and all your writings. And he said, his comment was, this is the weakness of Martin Luther. Unless I'm convicted by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. One man in the face of all these people. Brothers and sisters, that's not weakness. That's the power of God coursing through that man's life. The presence of God strengthening him. And these and untold thousands, even millions of other believers have lived victoriously under imperfect or unjust authority. And so we have our text. And I thought about this and I said, well, maybe we ought to think first of all what Peter is not saying. 
Peter's not saying, hey, if you're in an abusive relationship, just endure it. Just take it. That is not what he's teaching. So if that's the situation that you find yourself, you need to go to leadership. If you're in a church, you go to the leadership of the church and say, I need help. I'm in a situation that is just terrible. Uh, there are legal uh, resources and recourses for this situation. And do not think that just because you're a Christian, you can't uh, implement those legal things. Look at Acts 22, Acts 25, the Apostle Paul. He invoked his Roman citizenship. And as a result, he was not tortured when he would have been tortured. And uh, he appealed to Caesar, a higher authority than the lower courts, because he knew the lower court was going to condemn him to death unjustly. Oh, no. He's not teaching that oppressed people should just uh, take it. We ought to assert our legal rights. And, you know, I'm so thankful for organizations like First Liberty or Alliance Defending Freedom or Independence Law Center, which exist to uphold the legal rights of churches and individual believers to live according to their faith. Believe it, we're, we're Christians and churches have been facing more and more opposition in the last years, recent years, and it will continue. Peter is also not promoting slavery. You know, we read this and we say, oh, be subject for the Lord's sake. Uh, excuse me, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And people have read that and say, see, the Bible promotes slavery. But let us acknowledge that to any right-thinking person, slavery is repugnant. And the New Testament acknowledges the existence of the institution of slavery. But it was woven into the fabric of, first century, of the first century world. But if you read the New Testament and you read about what is the church, the church is the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ, Paul wrote in Galatians, he said, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither male nor female. There is neither, what's the next couplet? Neither slave nor free. What he's saying is, he's not denying the reality of the existence of gender and, and ethnicity and whether people were slaves or free. He's saying, but we're all one in Christ. And so woven into the fabric of the local church is the reality that in Christ we share the common salvation. And one isn't better or more important than the other. And so as, as that truth was lived out, you had, you had assemblies where you had people who were slaves, but there were leaders in the church because the church recognized this truth. So no, Peter's not promoting slavery, and nor is he glorifying suffering. The call to discipleship in this letter is not a call to suffering. It is a call to do good, even if it leads to suffering. There's a distinction there. That, to me, is a helpful distinction. We are called to do good. That's our calling, even if it costs us. But our, our calling is to do good, and if it costs us because doing good is now evil, then so be it, we'll suffer. But the call is to do good, is to serve other people. This is to be just like Jesus. This is the suffering that Jesus faced. In other words... Peter's saying, don't stop doing good because it may bring you suffering. Keep doing what is right. And if necessary, endure the suffering that comes along with it, knowing that you are walking in the steps of your Savior. So patient endurance of unjust suffering will shine a breathtaking light on God's worth. Victorious living, then, involves this in terms of under unjust or uh, imperfect authority. The first part of this is willing submission or submitting willingly as to the Lord, to, to either kind and gentle authority or to unjust authority. And he says, Peter says in verse 18, that we ought to do it with respect. We ought to respect the masters. Uh, we ought to uh, submit with respect. And so, given the context of, the, of this text, 
I think we're to understand this respect as looking past the unjust authority to the Lord, like as to the Lord, verse 13, because the Lord is the source of, the, of all authority. No authority has all authority except God. God is the giver of, the source of, the maker of, the structure of authority. That doesn't mean then that every authority is just. Obviously because of the sinful heart of mankind, often authority becomes unjust. But we are to give respect even to unjust authority because of who is behind that authority, and that's God himself. Peter bases his commands in this section on our devotion and commitment to God. He uses phrases like verse 13, for the Lord's sake. Verse 15, for this is the will of God. Verse 16, live as servants of God. Verse 19, you're mindful of God. Verse 20, you're living in the sight of God. In other words, all of life is quorum deo, before the face of God. And as you live that life before God, it may mean living under authority that is not just. You should still respect it because God is the giver of authority. Now, he's not the author of sin. Don't mix those two up. Because our focus is on the Lord we serve, then we die to sinful responses to unjust authority. What would be those sinful responses? Well, <laughs> that's a pretty long grocery list if you ask me. How I could, re you and I could respond to unjust authority could, <laughs> could occur in a number of ways. We could become angry, bitter, we could rebel against it, we could get even, we could gossip, we could disrespect authority, we could have self-pity, we could foment discontent among others, we could just do the minimum to get by, after all, ah, that, that's, they're not worth serving, just do the minimum, we could withdraw, we could become disloyal, but we serve the Lord, and so we serve those around us, even under authority that we would consider imperfect. We serve with gusto because we're ultimately serving the Lord. And that's the truth. And so, how do we live uh, under unjust authority? How do we live victoriously? We submit willingly as to the Lord. And then we get God's point of view, and there are several points underneath this. And, and that's kind of how this message will end, uh, under God's point of view. We see the situation from God's point of view. And that's verses 19 to 25. The key idea there is that we're mindful of God. We live in, the, in God's sight, God sees, and God's aware. So God's point of view. What is God's point of view? Look at verse 19. First, the first thing about God's point of view is that enduring suffering for doing good is commendable. God actually says this is a gracious thing, and he says it twice. At the beginning of verse 19, at the end of verse 20, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows. Look at the end of verse 20. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So God sees. God is there. God is with you. He, uh, you should be mindful of that. How we respond to unjust treatment must be motivated by the strengthening, omnipresence, and omniscience of God who rewards respectful submission to imperfect authority. God is with us, watching and empowering us so that we can be responding in a godly way, mindful of God. You see, we're accountable to God. God says it's commendable. He's looking for our response to authority, whether it's just or unjust. And so we desire to please God. Whether pleasing God brings good to us or brings suffering to us, we're accountable to Him for our response to it. And so we should, we should seek God's approval first and not compromise our beliefs or our faith in God or his word. And sometimes, therefore, we must choose suffering over acceptance of others. And when we do that, when we do that, 
When we patiently endure un- injustice, it sh- for the name of God, for the, for the word of God, it shines a bright and breathtaking light on God's worth. Because people begin to ask, what is it about this God that you love that inspires such loyalty and humility that you continue to follow him even when it costs you so much? We want people to ask us that question. Why is God worth so much to you? See, enduring suffering is commendable because it displays the worth of God to a watching world. Favor and blessing comes to those who cherish and treasure God above earthly vindication and respect or acceptance. So God's point of view in this suffering is that it's commendable. If we do good and suffer for it, God says that is commendable to him. The second thing is that enduring suffering for doing wrong is not commendable. And that's a self-evident statement. So here's, here's how I see that. Look, if I'm going to suffer, if I'm, if I'm going to have to suffer, it's going to be because I don't deserve it. I'm certainly not going to do things to bring it on me. Because if somebody does something and they have to do their time, so to speak, uh, you know, even if they patiently endure it, you know, we don't go around and say, isn't that something? They just, they did that, they stole that car, and they're in jail, and they're just as patient as ever. I have never heard anybody commend someone for suffering for what they deserve. It, hey, just do your time. You, you deserve it. It's not commendable. There's no reward. And so, we, you know, victorious living under unjust authority certainly means that we don't do things that are wrong and then we suffer for it and deserve it. So it's not commendable. So that's the second part of God's point of view. Enduring suffering for doing wrong is not commendable while enduring suffering for doing good is commendable. The third aspect of God's point of view is in verse 20. It says, for what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And then on to verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. For t- verse 21. For to this... You have been called. God's point of view is is that enduring suffering for doing good is our calling because it imitates Jesus. Enduring suffering for doing good is our calling because it imitates Jesus. I think Peter here is is going right back to what he heard uh, that we have recorded in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. I'm going to read it to you. Jesus, uh, this is uh, about Jesus speaking to uh, the disciples and the crowd. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Spirit angels. Here, Peter, in in verse 21, is telling us this is the call to discipleship that Jesus gave. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. For to this you have been called. To what? A cross. 
We've been called to a cross. Jesus went to the cross, and he, and he said, I'm going to take up my cross, and he's saying, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross as well. A cross. Oh. There's four things about a cross that are relevant here to us in this text. A cross represented official opposition from the government. The Roman government had the right to crucify people. Be ready, beloved, to lose your rights. If you want to save your life, then you will seek acceptance rather than opposition. That rather than facing opposition. If you want to save your life from official opposition, then seek acceptance from other people. But a cross will mean official op opposition from the government. A cross represented shame. The whole picture of, of crucifixion was one of shame. So if you want to save your life, then you'll, have to, you'll be living for your own glory. You have to make a choice. Will I live for my own glory or will I accept the shame of following Jesus? A cross represented unspeakable suffering. So, but if you want to save your life, then live for comfort. And a cross always led to death. But if you want to save your life, then you'll live for safety. You have to make a choice about your discipleship. What will it be? You know, I was reading a report from the Voice of the Martyrs, and um, it's a report about our brothers and sisters in Christ suffering in India. And this report is basically a reflection of what Jesus said that we have in Mark 8 and what we read here in Peter about following Jesus. The report about our brothers and sisters in India is this. One of the biggest threats to Hindu nationalist ideology in, in, in India is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which frees Hindus from the bondage of trying to appease or earn the favor of millions of false gods. In the gospel, if the gospel continues to spread, India cannot become the land of the Hindus. That's what Hindu nationalism is all about in India. We, we want to become the land of the Hindus. So the Christian gospel wipes away all, all these false gods, all this demonic worship, and says, no, we worship one true and living God, Jesus Christ. The gospel is a threat to the, the government in India that wants to become Hindu. India has pushed for a purely Hindu nation. And as a result, last year, between May, June, and July, five believers were murdered because of it. Either pulled from their home, uh, just unthinkable horror, perpetrated just for the sake of the gospel. And many other believers are suffering there. And church meetings are routinely targeted. Imagine, you know, having a church service and uh, all of a sudden the doors, are, the doors burst open or rocks through the windows and people come in and they disrupt the service and, and they chase everybody out. Ma imagine living like that. But that's what's happening in the country of India and it's uh, sanctioned by the government because because India's leaders want India to be a Hindu nation, and the gospel says, no, Christ is Lord. It's a page right out of our text today. This, is, this isn't like a first century book that we're studying, and um, isn't it great to, to kind of read this? Uh, boy, I wish, I wish I could, you know, uh, attain to that kind of commitment. I'm telling you, believers around the world, not just India, Afghanistan, Malaysia, North Korea, uh, Pakistan, and country after country, uh, China, our brothers and sisters are living this out. 
they are suffering for what is right and good, and it's government sanctioned, and it, and it has a, a complete spectrum uh, or levels of suffering anywhere from you know, shame, shaming people all the way to taking their life. But this is our calling, beloved. This is our calling. And I, as I looked at that word calling, verse 21, for to this you have been called, I looked up the word in, in um, the New Testament. It's a rich word, calling. And most often, the lion's share of the uses of the word call have to do with God drawing us to himself. In other words, God calls us to faith in Jesus. He arranges circumstances so that we hear the gospel. He arranges things in our life so that we want the gospel. We sense our need. We are uh, realizing our, our sin and our, our need of forgiveness. And, and then we, he opens our heart to trust in Christ and to be, and to be a child of God. And that whole process that, that draws us to himself is called God's calling of us. And, and so that's a rich word, but it's not limited to that. <clears throat> there are many other uses. God calls us to live in peace. He calls some to a life of singleness, 1 Corinthians 7, 17. He calls some into the ministry. But he calls all of us to a holy life, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. God has called us for holiness, not impurity. And here in our text, Peter is talking about another aspect of our calling. To this you have been called. Called to do good, even if it means suffering. But I want you to see a really awesome thought. Along with God's call comes the power to fulfill it. Jot down this reference, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Paul writes, Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, okay, it's a passive voice, be kept blameless. In other words, the, the, the subject is being acted upon. Be kept blameless. In other words, something is happening in us that's keeping us blameless. And how is it happening? May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. In other words, not only is he who call you, calls you holy, therefore be holy, but he who calls you is faithful, so he will enable you to fulfill the calling that he has put on your life, which is to walk in the steps of Jesus. How do you think our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are suffering great loss because of Jesus Christ, how is it do you think they can absorb that? It's because faithful is he who called them. He will also do it. Yes, it's make every effort in their part. Yes, but in the end, it's the faithfulness of God enabling them to follow in Jesus' steps. I think that is some of the best news. That is hope. Because when I look at this text, I must admit, you know, I sat there this week and I was struggling. <laughs> I look at this and I read this and I say, whoa, it's not the first time I've read it, but, you know, we have, to, we have to take it seriously. God calls us to obedience and to, to do good, to serve, and even if that leads us into suffering, let us follow Jesus. And yet I see that God enables us to fulfill the calling. The really interesting thing is the person in whose steps we walk, Jesus, the person who we follow, who took up his cross and suffered, the person who says, we too take up our cross and follow him, that person is, was crucified, was buried, was raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and the very crucified but now living, glorified Jesus is the one who assists us to enable us to walk in his own steps. Isn't that wonderful?
that is so wonderful. Is that I, you know, it's it's like you know, um, you have a little child, and the child puts his his or her feet on your on your shoes, you know, and so then you hold you hold his or her arms, and then you walk. And why? And this is before the little kid can walk, right? <laughs> but he's walking, or she's walking. But why is he she walking? <laughs> She's walking because you're doing the walking, because you're lifting that little one up. And that's what the risen, glorified Christ is doing. He's walking with us. He's walking, in one sense, for us as he strengthens us. And so then we can imitate Christ. What is the imitation? Well, verse 22, uh, he, was, he was sinless. Uh, we're not sinless, obviously, But in other words, his suffering was unjust. How do we know it was unjust? Well, verse 23, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. So here's a person who didn't, he never said said anything wrong, he never thought a wrong thought, he never did a sinful action. He never, there was no deceit, there was no shadiness about his life. What you saw is who he was. He committed no sin. And yet he suffered. So his suffering was unjust. How do we imitate Christ? It must be unjust suffering. No, we're not sinless. But we can live blameless lives by his power. And then when he was reviled, he, he didn't revile in return. In other words, he didn't respond to sin sinfully. Say it another way. He didn't sin when he was sinned against. He didn't retaliate. He, he, he didn't revile. He didn't trade uh, trash talk to the nth degree. You, you know, I'm not talking about sports now. He, he didn't revile when he was reviled. He didn't threaten, oh, you're going to get yours. Think about it. Of all the people on the planet who could have said, oh, you're going to He didn't say that. In fact, what did he say? He said seven things when he was crucified. What was one of them? Father, forgive them. So he didn't revile. And that, I think, was why part of the reason why the centurion, who was looking up at the whole spectacle, said, I just crucified the Son of God. You know, he realized that this was not just a man. This was the God-man, the Son of God. So he didn't sin when he was sinned against. And he continually, verse 23, the last phrase, he continued entrusting himself to him who judges just, justly. Oh, oh, beloved, there is a just judge. Make no mistake, there will come a day when any injustice will be dealt with in a, in a, uh, a way that's unthinkably horrible. Because God's wrath is is a burning fire. So there is a just judge. But guess what? It's not you. You are not the executioner. You are not. You are a servant of Jesus. You follow in his steps. And so he, he entrusted himself to the just judge. And he said he was willing to wait and trust God to sort things out. And so we too, knowing the love of God in our life and his perfect plan for our lives, we can trust him to sort out things that come into our life that just don't seem right. And Jesus, therefore, is the ultimate example of injustice perpetrated upon him. He suffered for sins he didn't commit. He was our substitute. He died in our place. He bore our sins in his body. Verse 24 and 25. Paul said he became sin, even though he knew no sin. So that we would not only be spared eternal judgment and have eternal forgiveness of sin and life, but that now we would become addicted to righteousness. See that? Verse 24. He bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Die to sin and live to righteousness. Have you ever considered that the only reason we have salvation 
uh, Peter uses the word healing at the end of verse 24. By his wounds, we have been healed. That's a quote from Isaiah 53, 5. He's not talking about, so if you turn your life over to Christ, you'll never be sick again. It's not what that verse is teaching. I know that some people believe that. That, that would mean that every true Christian should never die of an illness. They'd have to die of some you know, tragic accident or something or, or persecution, but never of sickness. And I'm sorry, but I don't think reality bears that out. Healing there is meaning salvation because sin is like sickness. And so healing would be salvation. By his wounds, you have been healed. Have you ever considered that the only reason that we have salvation is because, are you ready for this? The most heinous injustice ever perpetrated against a human being caused the very sacrifice that purchased our salvation. The righteous for the unrighteous, our substitute. If Jesus was not treated with the most heinous injustice, we would not have a right standing with God. There would have been no crucifixion. Imagine that. So, a fourth and final aspect of God's point of view is in verse 25. Look at it. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And that is this, God's point of view, enduring suffering for doing good may lead to others following you. I, what Peter is saying, among other things, is this. Do you think that somebody else who's mistreating you is so worse than you that they'll never make it? I could never save them. Oh, I saved you, but see, you weren't really a bad sinner. See, I, I, I saved you because, well, you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't quite up to that level where I could reach. You know, Peter is saying, hey, I want you to think back on what you were. You were straying like sheep. You are committing, that's another quote from Isaiah, by the way. What, remember the verse? Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. In other words, we, the creation of God, have committed cosmic treason against him. We have rebelled against him. That rebellion is sometimes outward and fist shaking, and sometimes we just turn our back on him. But it's all rebellion. It's all going our own way. And none of us were like really easy targets for God's grace. We were all straying. But God got me. And you know what? That means that he can get anybody. So if you endure suffering for doing good, it may lead others to follow you as you follow Christ. You were once going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. As we remember Christ this morning in our communion, as you hold in your hand that bread and the cup, I know it's a, a you know, a little packet. You peel open the the top part, and out comes the the bread, and then another lid comes off. But at, don't be tripped up by that. And if you don't have, if you didn't collect that on your way in. Uh, Feel free to get, get one now. Uh, don't, don't let that trip you up. As you hold in your hand the bread and the cup, just recall that the holy and righteous one who committed no sin, submitted to the Father's will, and suffered in our place. He endured the unjust wrath of sinners so that he could endure the holy and just wrath of God. It's an amazing thought that while Jesus, the innocent one, the righteous one, was suffering on the cross, and he was suffering unjustly. He didn't deserve any of that. He deserved glory and honor and and and. Praise, and instead he got nails, a crown of thorns, a sword in his side. He and shame. He endured 
injustice from and, and the wrath, uh, uh, un unjust wrath of sinners so that he could be put on a cross and endure the just wrath of God against you and against me. Think about that this morning as you hold that cup and realize the great, great love of God for sinners and the lengths to which he went to save his people from their sins. Let's rejoice together. So um, we're going to have communion here. And um, the Bible says, Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 11, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this bread is my body. It didn't change substance or anything like that. He meant this is a symbol. This is a symbol of my body. And then he took the cup. It says in Corinthians, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, the cup of the new covenant, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Before we, before we eat, I think we should evaluate our discipleship. No one here is a perfect disciple. Uh, if you are, uh, you're going to really be disappointed with the rest of us. <laughs> We, but we ought to evaluate our discipleship. We ought to ask, do we live for comfort? Do we live for our own glory? Do we live for safety? Do we live for acceptance from the world? Or do we embrace our calling, our calling to do good, to serve, to obey God's will? And if it means, if it leads to difficulty, hardship, suffering, trial, rejection, or even persecution, if, if it leads there, just know that there's somebody ahead of you, and that's Jesus, who's gone ahead. And so we're just going to follow him. How are you doing with that? How am I doing with that? I think it would be good for us to just pause and, um, and just ask God to work on our hearts just now before we eat this bread and drink the cup and just say, Lord, how am I doing? Show me where my discipleship is weak. And may I be strengthened, for you have said, faithful is he who calls you, he will do it. Let's just let's quietly just talk to the Lord silently, and then we'll eat together uh, in a worthy manner. Heavenly Father, as we think about the words of Jesus, about saving our life by living for acceptance, for glory, for ourselves, for living for you, forgive us where we have crossed over from one place to the other, and we, we live for safety. Give us grace to live for Jesus for wherever it takes us because we know he's gone before us. Give us grace to serve, to do good. And if it brings difficulty into our life, Lord, we have confidence that you will be faithful to us. Just like you are faithful to our brothers and sisters who are persecuted around the world. You're faithful to them. You give them grace. And when they report back, all they say is, I can't believe I, I was given the opportunity to show the, the breathtaking beauty and value and worth of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, give us grace. And as we remember Jesus now in his death, uh, help us to renew our discipleship and our commitment to him. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's... First of all, eat the bread in remembrance of Jesus and the body that bore our sins.
And then let's remember Jesus and the blood that he shed by which our sins are cleansed. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus.